Take a breath, step outside. Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us here at uh, Indigenous Ways. We acknowledge always our traditional owners of the country throughout Turtle Island, and we pay respect to the elders past and present. We want to take this time to acknowledge the traditional owners and caretakers of these lands we reside on here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Always we acknowledge and honor the Pueblo people. There's 19 Pueblos around us. And wherever you're beaming in from, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional ancestors and owners of your lands so that we could all be here today. Indigenous Ways is dedicated to bridging cultural exchange with people globally, and our goal is always to let the walls of separation go down so that we can all walk together, learn from each other, and learn how to speak to each other in a respectful way and be allies. And in that way, we uh, disrupt colonization's mindset. So that's a big thing for Indigenous Ways. And we will continue to say that and do that with this nonprofit. Uh, we started uh, in April when the pandemic first hit and we, we thought on our feet and overnight we came up with this idea to represent people from all over uh, to be, be able to stay connected on this platform, which was new to all of us, Zoom. But since then we've been able to feature more than 70 indigenous LGBTQIA2 plus musicians, storytellers, elders, young people, basically everybody, so that everybody can have a voice. So this evening is a very, very special evening that we have been so looking forward to. And the reason is because we have tonight with us Eve Wiggins, who is hailing in from Phoenix, Arizona. Eve is a well-traveled woman that has a lot of experiences, a lot of strengths, a lot of empowerment, and a lot of uh, gates that open where she says, no is not in my vocabulary unless I use it as a full sentence. Beautiful boundaries we want to learn from. So let's give it up for Eve. Hey, Eve, thanks for joining us this evening. Woohoo! How's it going, Eve? Thank you so much for having me here. Awesome, Eve. Thank you for being with us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself before we start this uh, interview? Sure. All right, um, so I grew up in Los Angeles, California. Um, I went to a residential deaf school. Um, well, really, actually, first of all, let me go back. Um, I actually was in a mainstream school. Um, there was a lot of diversity in my school system. I grew up with various peoples of colors and I was in school from about five to 11. Um, and so at that time I communicated with my friends using black American sign language. I remember meeting one boy at that time um, that was Jewish and, you know, he said, oh, well, why are you here? I'm from the Black school. And he said, well, where did you learn your sign language? Um, you know, and at that time, he was in Riverside, California, um, you know, and we had conversations about what things were, um, were, were better as far as communication and how communication then dictated your education, et cetera. Um, so we talked about the different signing systems that people learn, and he was learning C, signing exact English, as well as total communication. And he was interested in learning American Sign Language at that time. Um, and I remember, um, you know, my mother wouldn't actually let me go to the residential school in Riverside. My mother wanted to keep me in Los Angeles at the because they had a deaf program at that particular school um, during that time. It was about a two hour drive actually to go to Riverside from where I lived and that was pretty far. Um, you know, and of course I wanted to keep my relationship and connection to my family and community. Um, so to have to travel two hours for school Monday through Friday, my mother didn't want me to do that. Um, and so so 
I was telling you about the deaf boy that I met um, that was from Riverside. He was in, going to school in Riverside from fall to spring. Um, and again, my mother wouldn't let me go. You know, I had to fight hard to finally get permission to go to school in Riverside to the residential school. And it was there that I met so many deaf people. I mean, the sign language, the, the grammar, the non-manual um, markers, the American sign language, including black American sign language, it was just, it was beautiful. And I saw that the education and the vocabulary and these things that before had been criticized were all there and were all thriving. So of course that made me even more curious. Um, and so through the years, I learned so much sign language. Again, Black American Sign Language. Um, you know, I, of course, I had that already from growing up and communicating with my friends. But I also noticed, though, that there was a difference with how white people use American Sign Language. And so I learned and internalized that language as well. Um, and so, you know, for the white American sign language, it was more like educational language. It didn't really include, you know, the culture, the movement, the rhythm of what I was accustomed to with black American sign language, um, but it was, it was more academic. Um, and so again, I kind of traverse both worlds, black American sign language, as well as the traditional American sign language. And so that is where I am from. That is awesome. So, go ahead. And then let me also add, um, that I didn't have a lot of communication at home, but more so expressions. Awesome. That is so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that. And can you explain to us a little bit about, uh, it's a twofold question I'm going to ask. There's, you're talking about Black American Sign Language and American Sign Language. So I'd like to hear a little bit about the difference between those two. And then the other thing I want to ask you is, is there a difference between uh, black culture and black uh, deaf culture? Are there similarities? And can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Um, so there's two different ways of interacting with people, right? I interact with my Black friends one way using Black American Sign Language. We have a lot more expressions um, you know, and Black hearing people have slang as well, but Black American Sign Language has its own form of slang, like, hey, whatever, I'm a badass, whatever, here we go, right? I can show you my attitude and my expression in my body language. And so that is very much a part of Black American Sign Language. Um, and I mean, really, basically, I guess the same as American Sign Language right? Um, there are expressions. If I, if I looked at somebody and I said, are you talking to me? Or are you doing that to me? Um, I'm showing the attitude. I'm showing the, the cultural rep representation. I'm being very bold. I'm being very direct. I'm giving you all of me and I'm showing it, right? I'm putting emphasis on that. Whereas American Sign Language tends to be, again, pretty uh, like a linear mode of communication. Um, it doesn't have as much expression or as much drama compared to Black American Sign Language. Um, and once you get to know um, Black American Sign Language, you really just internalize it. It becomes kind of an automatic expression. I'll, I'll give you another example. If I'm communicating with my hearing family, my mother might say, "Oh, um, go and uh, go and get this. Be, go and get your brother because before you get in trouble, you know." And it's not just saying it; it's also in in her how she chooses to express it and kind of the attitude that goes along with that. Like, "Oh, I'm gonna go and get him. I'm gonna go go do or go do this or go do that." But it's also emphatic. It's not just saying the term. And it's interesting um, when a white person might speak that, um, like, hey, I'm going to kick your ass. Um, you know, a black person would say the same thing as I'm going to whoop your ass, right? It's different if you can catch my drift and get what I mean. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And um, did you want to talk a little bit about uh, black culture, like with uh Deaf culture and hearing culture, is there any, any intersections and bridging in there or similarities or how is it the same and how is it different? 
Okay. Um, so of course there are differences, right? Because hearing people are auditorily, um, you know, they can hear the slang, they can hear and pick up the vocabulary, but for deaf people and black American sign language, there's a lot more home signs, a lot more gestures. Um, sometimes vocabulary is limited because people learn vocabulary late in life and they become behind in that area. Um, for hearing people in Black culture, there's a lot of idioms, I would say, and a lot of different slangs that are used. Um, in Black American Sign Language, there are some of those same things. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, ah, you know, like a hearing person may, may verbalize it. Let me think of So a, a, a hearing person um, may say, well, first of all, child, and second of all, and third, but with deaf people, um, it's going to be a, a, a little bit different, right? But you can still see some of the same movements and some of the same attitude in the expression as they're talking, you know, and that that is Black ASL. It may not be the exact term, the exact idiom, but a lot of the same drama and emphaticism is still present. Right. That's that's really uh, that's really uh, informative. And thank you very much for saying that, because uh, uh, there's similarities in uh, vernacular in even the Navajo Nation in in uh, where I grew up. We have certain dialect sounds that they say uh, differently in, in the south. And, and it's just it's it's very different, but it's very um region oriented kind of like american sign language the way somebody in california will say colorado and the way someone in colorado will say colorado or depending on uh what age group they come from generational or for example <clears throat> on the navajo reservation where we just came from last week where i'm from uh the sign for the navajo people we met they use this sign for navajo like the N lexicalize for the Indi Indian. And then in New Mexico, they do this for Navajo, uh, which is more the shawl off the side of the arm. So it's uh, definitely, uh, people do speak differently. So I was just curious about that with your language as well. So uh, thank you for uh, talking about that. And uh, the other, oh, okay, And then I'll, I'll, I'll add one more thing. Um, that I have met so many Black deaf people in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, in California, it, there's not that many. I mean, there's myself as well as a few others that I've met, but people are pretty spread out. Um, you know, I've, I've met a few people at school, but they tend to be of kind of an oral mindset, um, not really culturally deaf. Um, but I recall visiting Washington, D.C., and I was taken aback Oh my goodness. I mean, the black soul, I finally found it. The cultural black deaf people that just embodied that. I was like, oh, teach me more. I want so much more of that. Um, you know, I, I, I just wanted to soak it up because that is what I had been waiting for. And I was like, where are they from? And here they are right there. And there were people from North Carolina and I met people from Georgia and I met people from all over and they signed Black American Sign Language naturally. And I found so that I had so much in common um, with, the, with um, that community. It was just amazing. It was an amazing experience. That's awesome. So um, when I think about a culture, I think about one group as a whole, like Native American culture, Black culture, um, different factions of European culture. Here in America, they call them white culture or Caucasian culture. But within the uh, it, but within your culture, is there different like subgroups, like different cultures within the culture? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. Um, there are, are different, definitely different subcultures. Um, you know, I, I think about um, what type of food 
people eat. Um, there's so much variation, um, you know, depending on where people grow up and where their families come from. If families in the South that may then um, move to the West are going to eat differently than other uh, people that are from the West. Um, I can think of um, two Black families, for example. Um, so the families are, are, are completely different. They're different in the way that they communicate. They may have similarities, um, like there may be deaf in the family. It could be hearing parents and deaf children or vice versa. And there may be some similarities, um, but people's style of communication, for example, whether or not they have formal um, language or whether or not they use signing exact English, total communication, home signs, as well as what expressions they use, you know, in English or other languages, it all varies. It, it all varies. Um, and, you know, I mentioned this earlier, and I will say it again, that even in hearing culture and deaf culture in the Black community, you still see that same um, emphaticness and attitude in how certain statements are conveyed. Um, and again, people have different preferences. Some people like spice, some people don't. Um, you know, I have met people from, uh, you know, Africa, for example, that don't necessarily fall in line with some of the more traditional Black culture that's here in America. Um, they, some people find certain things disrespectful. It just, people are very, very different. And I think it's so important to respect people's culture, whatever that may be and where they're from. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much. Uh, so another question that I was thinking about asking you is, you know, this month, February is Black History Month. Um, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, what do you ha what do you feel about the United States of America having Black History Month? What does that mean to you? Well, honestly, We celebrate our culture and, and really this month is for people to become aware of our culture as well as our collective suffering. And also it, it, it's a time to show our history, to show how we've thrived, to say that we are still here, that we're not going to be pushed to the side or dismissed. And so Black History Month is, is a time for that to learn about what Black people have, have done and contributed to this country over the years. Um, you know, and especially I would say for Black deaf people, I want to learn more about things that have been hidden from us. I want to know more and discover more about our culture, about Black American sign language and so forth. I, I want to, you know, just, I want our voice to be heard in America. I want to share my voice in America and to say that it's time for change. And I believe that our, our people that should be celebrated in history should be celebrated and should be respected. Wow, that is so positive. I love your attitude about that. Uh, I feel the same way about uh, National Native American Month that we uh, celebrate in, I think it's October. Uh, I think it's in October. And uh, it's, 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 it's a, you know, every day is Native American day for me because we've been here, you know, we've been here. So uh, I think that's wonderful, your attitude about right, this. Right, exactly. It, yeah, it's, it's, it's positive. It's really beautiful. So thank you for saying that. Um, so I was going to ask you also about, um, one time I went, we were in DC and Elena really wanted to go to the, uh, Black History Museum. So we had to get the tickets way in advance to get into that. And we started right. from, I think the bottom floor and we worked our way up. I don't remember how many floors it was, but by the time we walked out of there, we were looking at Michael Jackson and his family and Whitney Houston and 
uh, some of these people that just shaped American music, uh, everything from jazz to blues. And then um, it was just such an enlightening experience to see. Well, it was sad. There was a lot of sadness. I'm not going to lie. Uh, there was not a lot of kindness in the beginning, for sure. But just to see what cult your culture has done. Uh, with the movements in this country, not only with language, but with music and with dancing and with entertainment. And you're talking about Black American Sign Language, you know, the beat, the rhythm, it's it's bigger, it's fuller, it's just all this stuff. So how do you think about people uh, kind of taking from your culture or copying your culture and turning that into their own kind of style and music are you do you feel okay with like people um well, taking on black asl or taking taking some of the stuff from your culture and and utilizing it for their own artistic expression or whatever have you had any thoughts about that I mean, it's good that we can be a role model. And I, I think that as long as people are respectful of other people's culture and their expression when it comes to music or sign language, that's important. Um, if, you know, there was, if a hearing person was, you know, a musician or an artist, deaf people can't hear that an interpreter would be interpreting that, but I don't think that's necessarily kind of taking um, their their culture. I think that people need some, some type of simulation, like pe people need something to inspire them, um, to, to kind of arouse them. Um, and so really when we can, music is about connection. Yep. It's about connecting with other people. And, and I believe that it should be shared in that type of spirit. So hopefully that would impel them to connect them. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't want anybody to miss out on, on that connection or on that part. Well, I'll tell you what, you all have been really good teachers. I'll tell you what, because uh, I've, I've heard some amazing music i've seen amazing moves and i remember when i was a kid on the navajo reservation we had a little tiny tv with a very blurry reception with an antenna outside hooked up to the house and every saturday morning they had this show it was a dance show i don't remember what it was called if you guys can help me out it was something where all these people would come together and they would dance was it soul, soul train? train yeah so i think yeah and I would be in the den copying all the moves. They would stand in a like this and a, a couple would dance together and line up and, and I'd be following them. And I remember every Saturday, that was my favorite show because I could learn how to dance. So uh, you, you, I, I was like, I got to learn some of these moves because I mean, I'm stuck out here on the res and we don't have that kind of moves out here or, nor that kind of music. So it was, it was my time, Soul Train. So yeah, that's a good memory I have. Um, so for our, yeah, thank I, you. I miss that. I miss that show. And I wish that they would play reruns of Soul Train. Um, I would love to watch that again. Um, you know, just old times, old times, um, that show and, and others. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Okay, now I'm going to move into um, I know that you mentioned something about you liking to go to other countries, third world countries, and working with children that are deaf and uh, without access. Can you tell us a little about some of those movements you've experienced advocating for children? Sure, sure. Um, I have been to Mexico. Um, I stayed at a hotel while I was there. Um, and I remember watching TV and, and looking for the captioning. And I ended up meeting a Mexican girl there and we kind of gestured together to communicate. And I, I gestured, do you have antennas for the TV? Um, you know, and, and we talked about 
I talked about and encouraged her to advocate for herself for American with Disability ADA accommodations to make sure that she has captions so that she can access what is on the television so that she can watch the news so that she can see what's going on in the world. Um, and so, you know, it was just like it, very, very frustrating. Um, you know, because we have so many amenities in America that people don't have access to in other countries. Um, you know, I have friends, for example, from Africa where they also don't have captions on TV. Um, you know, they don't have places like the FCC to manage and mandate communication. And it's frustrating to see that. I'm very fortunate in that right um, because I have opportunities that other deaf people don't necessarily have, you know. And for them, it's like, well, they'll, they'll read a book instead of watching television, which that's ex acceptable for some. Awesome. That is so beautiful. Thank you so much for your work uh, doing that. That sounds like a fabulous thing to do. And uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, your work with uh, Video Relay. I know you work at Sorensen and I know Sorensen Video Relay, for any of you that don't know what Sorensen is, it's a video relay uh, service that uh, allows people to have access to communication uh, for people that don't know sign language. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you feel about VRS coming into our culture in the last 15 years compared to TTY when it was typing? Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? I sure do. I can't say too much about what I do at Sorensen. That is confidential and proprietary, but I can say that it is amazing to have a service where deaf people can make phone calls and speak to anyone through an interpreter. May it be a job interview, an appointment to a doctor, a reservation to a restaurant or hotel, and any other type of phone call that anyone might, might, might need to make. Having access to communication is fantastic. Having the autonomy to not have to depend on my parents like I used to back in the day to make the phone call. Having a direct communication instead of having to rely on a third party is different as well. At Sorensen, what I do, I help people get more access by providing them with video phones, the end touch system and whatnot. We also provide laptops for communication. We provide applications for cell phones. Just like hearing people can make phone calls on various devices, the idea is to also provide various devices for deaf individuals to be able to use to have their face-to-face -face phone calls and communication. The technology we have nowadays is such a blessing. Without that technology, I don't know what would happen to deaf folks like us. We'd have to send written out notes or be confined to a teletype writer, a TTY. But to be able to clearly express oneself in their native language, there's just nothing that compares to it. There's no limitations of the linear English language. No, I can see people's faces and I can communicate directly. And I must say, I love my job. Oh, that is so awesome, Eve. I'm so happy you're uh, there with Sorensen. Uh, that's beautiful. Congratulations. And congratulations for Sorensen for having you because you are dynamite. You're amazing. Your energy, your positive attitude, your excitement for life. I mean, just meeting you is such a treasure. <clears throat> and I really hope to see you in person one day. Uh, so finally, I'm going to ask you one more question and then I'm going to make some announcements and show a short video. And then now uh, we're going to open up the uh, the Zoom for everybody to join in. So the last question I have for you is this year we have decided to turn our theme to thriving in purpose. So have you had any thoughts about thriving in this and purpose in this year, especially since we're kind of uh, at some point in the coronavirus with vaccinations now and but we're still masked, we're still very much isolated and there's a lot of limitations to a world we once knew, which is nowadays, we're pretty much confined to this kind of communication as opposed to 
gatherings with people in live events if we don't want to get sick and die. So do you have a definition for thriving and purpose? Yes, Tosh. Yes, Tosh. I'd like to respond to that by saying before March 2020, things were just dandy, right? But you're right. The pandemic hit and everyone's behavior changed. People were cast into fear suddenly, untrusting of each other, wondering who might get me sick, people withdrawing from each other and making connections with others became tougher because nobody wanted to get sick. And so I think the question in a lot of minds was, what's next? What's next? Then Zoom came in the picture. And it's nice that we have this platform to be able to communicate through. And again, thinking of the deaf community without the technology, what would we, what would we do? How would we see each other face to face? Thanks to technology like Zoom, FaceTime, Sorensen VRS, ZVRS, and so on and so on. There's so much technology and so many technological companies that provide us the ability to work from home and still communicate. Now, the toughest part of the pandemic has been people wearing masks. It has been so difficult for deaf people to read lips, to lose half of the expressions on a person's face. Hearing people are fortunate. They can wear a mask and hear each other and understand each other. But for deaf individuals, having that mask covering half of a person's face, we can only rely on the eyebrows. And it leads to questionable assumptions. We're not really sure what a person is saying. And we sometimes just want to say, can you pull down your mask so I could see what mouth shape you're making and how that matches up with your eyebrows? Because I'll understand what you're saying much better. But it's very tough on both deaf and hearing people to come together and communicate. And I think the best part is that people haven't given up. And people have maintained that sense of, uh, of concern for security to protect themselves. And I see a lot of, and this is not the best, but people will type notes into their phone and show their phone to the other person to read that out and do that back and forth. But we want deaf people to stay healthy. We don't want them to get sick and have anything injurious or deleterious happen to them. And I really am looking forward to that day where we can return to coming together with no masks, where we can see each other for our face-to-face -face communication and share our expressions. But like I said, it's such a blessing. On the relay, we can make a phone call. No one has to wear a mask. You can see each other. We can sign in our native language. And technology is truly a blessing that way. Yes, thank you very much for that. And again, your positive attitude is a prescription for not only medicine, but also healing because, uh, there's hope. There's hope. We're, we're on to a good direction right now. And there's a vaccine out there and we're all going to get it very soon, I hope. So fingers crossed, prayers out. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Eve. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and just uh, take a moment just to, to share a few announcements and show a very short video for everybody. And then we're going to invite everybody to come in and be able to uh, see each other face to face. We lost a lot of people on that first round of uh, Zoom bombing that went on. So uh, we have a few people in tonight. So uh, I just want to mention uh, that next week we have our beautiful sister, Taz. She's a uh, uh, San Aldefonso Pueblo and African American. And she hails from San Ildefonso Pueblo. And she is a healer. And she's got a lot of beautiful gifts. So please join us next week for her. And uh, if you want uh, more information about Eve Wiggins and our Fe February Wisdom Circle and Concert Series, you'll also find a video library on our website where there's over 70 presenters that we have hosted on this platform. All of it is with ASL Access, the best ASL interpreters, as you can see. Uh, while at our website, indigenousways.org, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter so you can stay updated on our movements as we are evolving and below me is all of our social media pages please like and subscribe to them especially if you are currently viewing them now uh, this really helps us to keep doing what we're doing and thank you the more the merrier 
as I said before, all of our ASL events have all of our events have ASL interpreters. We are committed to that and we are going to continue to provide that service and hopefully raise the bar for everybody else to do the same thing. And we have to mention our, oh, these events are also free. We don't charge for any of this stuff. So everybody's welcome. Again, down with the walls of separation. Before I move on, I got to thank our sponsors. We would not be doing this without them. We have our Native American Advised Fund. We have our Santa Fe Community Foundation. We have West Staff. We have New Mexico Arts. And we also have a beautiful board group. So we want to thank our board members. Some of them are with us tonight. We love you. Thank you for all that you've done for Indigenous Ways. And of course, our individual donors that we have on this platform and otherwise. Uh, so I just wanted to mention real quickly that we've been doing Navajo Nation re relief runs, which all of you know about. We've done seven. And then last week, we added uh, Navajo deaf uh, people on the reservation that are doing, that have been doing without. And when I say without, I mean communication, transportation, and uh, they have not been able to access some of the uh, drop-offs that the tribe has done to the chapter house, the chapter houses. We have 110 different chapters on the reservation, and uh, we were able to connect with our beautiful brother from the Shiprock area. He lives in Tis Naspas. I'll spell that for you. That's T for Tom, E E C. N for Nancy, O-S, P for Paula, O-S, Tisnaspas, which is about a half hour from Shiprock, New Mexico. It's part of, part of the Navajo Nation. So Dennis Long uh, agreed to meet us in Shiprock to uh, drop off about 15 boxes for uh, the Navajo deaf people in close contact and community. So he was able to get a ride and uh, we met him there. And then we also were able to meet with our beautiful sister Arletta Tolan in Luca Chukai and uh, she has introduced us to some other people that have needs out there as well so not just supporting the Black Mountain Relief Run we've decided to add the Navajo deaf populations to our runs and we actually have uh, communication uh, coordinators uh, emissaries if you will Dennis Long and our Dennis Long representing the New Mexico portion of the Navajo Nation and Arletta representing the Arizona portion of the Navajo Nation. So we were able to um, videotape short clips of uh, both of them with a couple of other people, and we're going to show you that clip. So everybody enjoy this four minute video. Hello, my name is Dennis Long. That's my sign name. I'm a full blood Navajo, and I come from Tis Naspas uh, in Arizona, which is very close to here. It's 30 minutes away, and uh, I'm really grateful for the boxes from uh, Tosh and you, Elena, both of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. It was very nice. Hello. My name is Yolanda. This is my sign name, and at the moment, I live in Farmington. And uh, I am a full blood Navajo, and uh, I wanted to thank uh, both Tosh and uh, Elena uh, for the boxes. Uh, yeah, I did get some. I, I did get a, a box from President Navajo uh, Nez, uh, Tis Naspas. They did a, a, bo a drop at the chapter house. So I did get some uh, boxes. So I'm grateful for the president and supporting uh, the deaf people here in this area as well. Uh, me, I don't have, uh, I didn't get anything. Uh, this is the first time I'm getting anything now that I met you guys. And uh, yeah, this is the first time. Well, just to let you all know that uh, Dennis is a friend of mine and uh, he's the one that told me about you guys. So that's how I found out. Does, what about the president? Dennis is asking, has the president supported you? The chapter house are giving you anything. No, nobody has helped me. No, not, nothing at all. Yeah, uh, I try to help the deaf people that live around this area, uh, that live around the Navajo reservation, but uh, some of them don't have vehicles. So, uh, and uh, the families neglect them a lot. So 
Uh, so I, yeah, I, I just come here and she said, I agree with Dennis there. Yeah, oh. I'm in the same position as Dennis. Okay. Yeah, the hearing people just ignore us. Yes, absolutely, I would like that, yeah. Yeah, Dennis is saying ship rock uh, here in this area, I say about 15. They don't have vehicles, so there's no transportation for them. Uh, no, I actually borrowed it from my friend who's helping me to come here to get the boxes. And I'm gonna deliver the boxes once you guys leave and then I'll take my friend's truck back. That's so beautiful. We really appreciate both your service and what you can do. But uh, one of the things is that we don't want uh, the deaf and hard of hearing community left behind. Thank you very much, that's really good. And Ilana said, thank you very much, that's awesome. All right, there it is, everybody. Um, Tosh, Tosh, that was so touching. I am so touched by that. Tosh, can I ask you a question? Do the folks up in that area have video phones? Do they have access to equipment like that? Um, mostly, believe it or not, most people out there do have video phones. It's just crazy because even on Black Mountain, there's no running water a lot of places without electricity, but somehow everybody has a cell phone. The Navajo tribe does uh, support people that can't afford phones. And we use a company called Cellular One. It's kind of like Verizon. So there's uh, some towers on the reservation. Um, uh, Wi-Fi signals is a problem because a lot of the homes don't have uh, electricity. So it's hard to hook up with, uh, you know, uh, uh, to have, you know, in, internal Wi-Fi in your house. Um, <clears throat> but real quickly, I just want to tell people that we've added a donate button to our Navajo Nation relief run. So we will from here on out start supporting the Navajo deaf and hard of hearing communities that we're able to run into through our communication facilitators, Arletta and Dennis. So uh, on the 18th and 19th of March, we are going to be going back. We're going to be making our first stop in Shiprock, meeting Dennis, and then we're going to go probably camp out at our lettuce place in Luca Chukai, and then we're going to make our way up to Black Mountain and serve the indigenous elders and their families on top of the mountain. So the donate is really easy to get to on our website, and you can always uh, mail checks as well. <clears throat> so uh, I want to go ahead and invite everybody to come on in, everybody. We're 13 minutes from the top of the hour in honor of our sign language interpreters who have both been working all day long interpreting. We will end at 7 at uh, seven o'clock. So come in and say hi to beautiful Eve, our superstar tonight. We love you, Eve. Thank you. Let's start with Christina Bueno, CB on the chest. This is Christina. Oh, okay. I didn't realize you had a call on me. Let me start off by saying hi, everyone. This is Eve. Hello. And this is Christina. 
Eve, you know, I actually remember you from the school for the deaf in Riverside. We met there. Yes, we did. Now, when you were younger, did you go to Marlton? I did. Did you go there all your life? I was there in 77. Oh, okay, then I might have missed you because I went to Marlton for a visit when I was small. We took a trip from a school that was in another town. My school wasn't in Los Angeles. But your story was so amazing and captivating. Everything that you embody as a deaf person, your culture, Black culture, deaf culture, women's culture, everything that you embody as a deaf person is just so fascinating. What you recounted with us, I appreciate what you shared. Yes, and I did have a question. <laughs> it slipped my mind. Oh, no. Um, darn it. If, it. if it comes back, I'll pop up and ask. Okay, no problem. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's go to Sarah Young Bear Brown, SB. Hey, Sarah, what's up? Good to see you, sister. Hi. Hi. Yeah, me too, Eve. Your story was so captivating. Thank you so much for sharing what you did tonight. Yes. And, and just to know that we're all a part of it. Wow, so amazing. And then talking about Black American Sign Language, that's such a hot topic. Mm -hmm. I know that it's on everyone's mind right now. And I want to see the same thing happen with Plains Indian Sign Language. It's oh, also known okay. as PISL. Uh -huh. It's one of the oldest sign languages that's been in use for thousands of years. And it's what we use here. And I feel that it's not recognized because people focus too much on ASL. And I think what you mentioned is also a benefit to us as indigenous people to preserve our Plains Indian Sign Language, just like Black American Sign Language has been preserved. Yes, that would be awesome if you can share. What's the acronym? P-I- P-I-S-L, -S -S yes. P-I-S-L, I think that would be wonderful because I'm sure there are many people that don't know about your culture or language and would be surprised at, at learning this new form of communication. It's not only Black American Sign Language, there are so many others. And I believe that people are slowly beginning to be educated and starting to await to how many different cultures and languages there are and how you can, can benefit from just knowing the history mm -hmm. of your languages and communication. History is a part of our life. And I believe that that's what sign language is about. Yes. And I'm really curious. There is Black History Month. And we also have Afro-Indigenous folks. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with them or any folks like that. Yes, I have met some Afro-Indigenous people. I'm in North Carolina, um, as well as Georgia. Um, I, I've met people from the, the Cherokee Pueblo and from other Pueblos. Um, so yes, absolutely. They're also a, a part of the history. And again, it's so very important um, that people understand and that they cherish and value and know their history. Um, mm -hmm. um, and so we need to make sure that we are putting it out there on social media and, and getting kind of the, the traffic and, and the acknowledgement to increase awareness. Um, we definitely need more education and more respect. Eve, thank you so much. So nice to meet you. So nice to chat with you. So nice. Absolutely. I don't want to take up all your time. Thank you, though. I loved it. Nice okay. to meet you as well. Feel free to reach out to me on Facebook. I will. I will. Love it. Thank you so much, Sarah Young Bear. You are also one of our superstars. We love you. You are an amazing rocker out there. And boy, talk about action. Thank you. We miss you. We love you. Anytime, contact me. Okay? Love you, too. And uh, I just got to do a quick uh, uh, share on Thewesa, Ken Thewesa Kennedy. That's T-H-I-W-E-S-A, last name Kennedy. She says, Yao Ko, it's an indigenous word, Y-A-W-K-O, for sharing and keeping up and recognizing the need for accessibility for indigenous deaf people. Keep spreading the love. You, you're 
you're epic and you all rock. Thank you very much, Thewesa. And I think Sarah Young Bear has told me about you or we've been planning to contact you and invite you to our show. So uh, thank you very much, Thewesa. And another person also sent a link saying about Indigenous Month is actually in November. So my correction there, Indigenous Month is November. And then I'm just gonna say Christine McDewitt, thank you for joining us from Columbus, Ohio. And this is Christina. When I was a child, I would be beaten for showing any attitude. The white culture of my family was completely intolerant of it. Thankfully, I survived that and continue learning more about cultures different than my family of origin. I am happy to say I am not the doormat that I was raised to be. Thank you for inspiring words and encouragement. Thank you, Christine McDewitt. We love you. Okay, so let's go back to our our people on the screen. Let's start with Nijoni and we'll move to Missy. Nijoni, what's up? Oh, not much. I don't, I don't really know if I have very much to say. It's, I just really enjoyed what I came in for. I, I didn't come in for the whole thing. I kind of dropped in late because I, I got home back late. But but I really appreciate what you had to say today. And I, and I think that it's an important conversation for us to have, just talking about how... Um, you know, we get into Black History Month and it's such an important thing. And I think some people take it for granted and don't necessarily understand how important it is. And they also don't understand the ways in which people use it in ways just that aren't helpful. And this was this was a very helpful talk that we had today. And and I, I learned a lot today as well. So I really thank you very much for the wise words today. Your beautiful Nijoni. This is Nijoni's sign name. N beautiful. N I Z H O N I. And her beautiful mother is down below, Michelle Redman. Hey, Missy, you want to say something to Eve? Hi, Eve. Thank you for your talk. And and yes, you're very, you're very lively. And I really enjoyed listening to you. And it kept me, you keep my attention with what with what you have to say, your message. And um, I, I do think Black History Month is super important with regard to the culture and then how it affects the deaf culture too and how it's incorporated into the culture on the way, you know, the, the, the deaf community is treated and hard of hearing in the culture and, and the, the accommodations and respect. And, you know, like in our Native American, we have the Native American um, sign language for the for the for the deaf like you know and and I know that there's a little bit difference in the way that is done from the way ASL is and um, and you know but we've all had to fight for our rights you know as as um, as minorities native people Hispanics black people Asians India Indians from India and you know, just, you know, all, all our different cultures, what we've had to go through to just be recognized, you know, that we are, we, we count, that our voices count and, <clears throat> and for deaf culture, you know, deaf cultures, voices count. And there's a, there's a very beautiful and rich culture in that if, if people just take time to understand it and take time to be a part of it. And, uh, and I think that's really important with our communication and our outreach with each other and our cultural exchanges. And that's what makes this wisdom circle so important because that's what we do. That's what we strive for is we want to connect with people that are like us in certain ways, but very different so that we can have a better understanding of one another. So thank you for giving me that understanding and sharing your spirit with us tonight. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour and in honor of our beautiful interpreters, we're going to go ahead and close this evening. But first, I want to say quickly that I want to thank 
all of the viewers on our social media sites. I'd like to thank our Zoom audience for joining us tonight. I want to apologize for the rude awakening of bombers that came on at the beginning of the show, but that was all taken care of. So thank you all for your patience. And I would like to especially thank our beautiful ASL interpreters tonight for doing a spectacular job. And uh, I want to... Uh, I want to also, <laughs> sorry about that. I want to just say, Eve, we, you have no idea how much you enlightened us tonight about Black American Sign Language and about culture and subcultures and just having an overall beautiful attitude with th thriving and purpose in 2021. So thank you, Donna. Thank you for joining us this evening. Annette, we love you, sister. It's good to see you. Thanks for supporting us. And my what, what, last thing, Ludo Grant, L-U-D-O, last name Grant on social media says, thank y'all for everything in this presentation. Ludo, right on. Join us on Zoom next time so you can join us live. Okay, everybody, let's give it up for Eve Wiggins. Yee! Rock and roll, Eve. Watch the